Okay, so let's get started. So welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the second Technology Enhanced Learning Community of Practice meeting for 2022 uh, with another great guest speaker who I'll tell you a little bit about in a second. She's already there on the screen. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of a couple of different things in this particular meeting. We're going to do our, our usual sort of interview style speaker series. And then we've also got a little bit of best practice from Daryl Clare, uh, who is one of the champions of the COP. You'll see his name on the slide right there in front of you, Mr. Daryl Clare, OAM. He is a champion of the COP and he's going to tell us a little bit about some best practice he's doing at the moment. Um, I'm, I suspect he's going to tell us about what he's doing in Rockhampton at the moment because I think he's currently in Rockhampton at the moment doing some, some uh, residential schools, but I'll leave it to Daryl to tell us a bit more about that in a minute. Um, you'll remember that with these slides, I often introduce you to the COP. Um, I'm probably going to skip over that fairly quickly today because we, we kind of did that last time, but I did notice last time that we didn't have a uh, acknowledgement of traditional owners in the slides. And so I thought in 2022, we should definitely include that. And so I would like to start the meeting by acknowledging the traditional custodians of all the lands that we're meeting on. And as Robert said to Carmen just a few minutes ago, that is potentially across Queensland, across Australia, maybe even internationally as well, but certainly a pretty wide berth and pay our respects to the elders of, of those uh, lands, past, present and emerging. And uh, here in Brisbane campus, I'm currently on campus today. Uh, that's the uh, Jagara people or the Turbul people here in uh, on the Brisbane campus. Uh, but where I'm from, usually where I live on the Gold Coast, it's the Ugamba people. And uh, uh, Carmen mentioned in the chats before a few of you got here that she is on the Gadigal lands in Sydney. And uh, if you'd like to, you can feel free to type what the traditional lands are that you're meeting, that you're currently on in your particular location in the chat as well. So as I said, this is the blah, blah about what the COP actually does. I kind of feel like we've done this already, so I'm not going to spend much time on this. And instead, I'm going to get right to uh, the meat of what we're talking about. And so since I was skipping this, I thought I would do a little bit of a plug. And it's also a bit of a lead in to Carmen as well for, for a society that I'm involved with. And I think I've mentioned this society to you all before. But if I haven't, the society that I'm involved with is called Ascolite. I'm the vice president of Ascolite this year. And Ascolite has over 1,200 now professional and academic staff as members from tertiary institutions in Australia, New Zealand, and beyond. And Ascolite is all about technology enhanced learning. We're all about educational technology. And so I thought it would be appropriate to mention that to you as members of the Telcop. And it is also worth mentioning that Ascolite has unlimited, or CQU has an unlimited membership to Ascolite. That means that every staff member at CQU that wants to be a member of Ascolite can be. All you have to do is approach our institutional rep, which I'm pretty sure is Nadine Adams, but if you wanted to ask me, that would work too. And uh, we will join you up to Ascolite. And Ascolite is represented by the vast majority of institutions here in Australia. So you can see the list there on the slide and we're up there in the top right hand side. Uh, but you can see that um, the various other institutions are on this list as well. And if I'm spotting carefully, I can see the University of Sydney there on the bottom left hand side. And that is one of the contexts of which I know Carmen uh, is through the, the Ascolite Society and being a member of the Ascolite Society. Um, and it is worth noting, just in case you're saying, well, why would I join Ascolite? that Ascolite has something for everyone. We have a uh, fortnightly bulletin that you get. We have an awards program. We have a journal, the Australian Australasian Journal of Educational Technology, as well as various other publishing platforms, a research school, an annual conference, which everybody gets really excited about. And this year is being hosted in Sydney uh, with the conference dinner at Luna Park, which we're all really, really excited about, uh, maybe maybe face to face again, um, as well as the Wavelength podcast, you might hear me on the Wavelength co podcast occasionally, as well as a community mentoring program if you want some mentoring in technology enhanced learning. And so hopefully I've done a good job doing a bit of a sales pitch for Ascolite. Uh, the website is obviously ascolite.org. 
so you can go and you can read more about Ascolite or if you type Ascolite into Google, you'll be able to find all of those resources. And again, if you read about it and you go, ah, oh, this is something for me and you're a CQU staff member, which I'd imagine most of you are, then uh, you can get membership for free. All you've got to do is email our institutional rep and become a member. And then you'll get that fortnightly bulletin and have access to all of these programs. I think that's a, that's a good sales pitch. I thought I'd throw that sales pitch in for this week. And for those of you that don't know me, my name is Michael Cowling. I'm sure most of you know me already. Sometimes I'm called Professor Tech. Uh, I uh, tried to update this slide. You might have seen it last week. It's basically the same, um, except I mentioned smart homes down here in the bottom. And today what I'm going to do is I'm going to be your interviewer. I'm going to ask Carmen some questions. But if you have questions of your own, please feel free to also type them into the chat for us. And we will throw those questions at Carmen as well. And our moderator this week, as always, and Robert and I tick-tock between it, sometimes he's interviewer, sometimes I am. This week, Robert is the moderator, and uh, he's Dr. Robert Vanderberg. He is a senior lecturer in education at our university, based in Bundaberg, uh, and was just very recently, I'm not sure if he had this last time, was very recently awarded the AAUT Citation for Outstanding Contributions to Student Learning, which is very exciting. And he is also a CQ University Opal Award winner. He's also an avid fitness nut, much fitter than I am, uh, and also a committed Bundaberg native. If you want to see a cupboard full of Bundaberg rum merchandise, then the place to go is Robert's house, right? Bundaberg mugs, Bundaberg t-shirts, Bundaberg sheets, all sorts of different things it's awesome so that's our robert's our moderator this week and then finally i mentioned um our guest speaker which is miss carmen vallis from the university of sydney and carmen's bio is there on the slides it's really really long so i'm not going to read the whole thing but carmen is very well experienced in the area of uh technology enhanced learning and education in general. And you can actually see a list there, education, English, creative writing, ICT, English as a second language across secondary vocational and adult educational sectors. It's absolutely bonkers. And so we are very excited to have a conversation with Carmen today. And in particular, we're going to talk a little bit about lectures and how she thinks uh, lectures might uh, might move forward post pandemic and that's important to us because uh, we we decided that that's kind of going to be our theme this week and I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our uh, other guest speaker and I've got the guest in quotes because he is a co-champion of the Telcop and that is Mr. Daryl Clare OAM again crazy bio on there for you for Daryl that I'm not going to read including being a member of the Scouts Australia for 26 years an active volunteer in various different organizations his substantive role is as a lecturer in paramedic science at CQ University um, and of course he is also has the uh, um, Order of Australia medal list we forget, which is very exciting. And so Daryl's going to talk to us in the second half of the session a little bit about some best practice here at CQ University. But that's about it for me doing introductions, really. I want to get on to asking Carmen some questions, but I do try in these slides, I haven't done it for a while, but I do try and throw a, a silly picture in there if I can. And I couldn't find a silly picture of Carmen. I, I, so I thought I'll throw a silly picture in there of Daryl. And now he's looking a little bit concerned. He's like, well, <laughs> uh, not too silly, right? Uh, and in fact, you would argue a nice picture of Daryl, which is a, uh, something that happened a couple of years ago, which is when he met our uh, Prime Minister, Scott Morrison at Beef Week 2021, uh, talking to him all about some of the stuff he's gonna talk to us about today, which is 3D printing technology. I think the look on Scotty's face there is kind of like, what you're talking about, Daryl? I, I don't know. <laughs> How that works. Maybe he can tell us a little bit more about that when we see him. But uh, obviously, the vice chancellor is very excited about that at the time. Um, and so that kind of gets me to the end of my my blah blah slideshow. So what we're going to do now is we'll, we'll have a little bit of a chat with Carmen. And I'm actually going to look forwards now because you guys aren't over to the right hand side. So that makes things a little bit easier. And I, I, what we usually do is we do some interview questions here. And as I said, if you have any questions, ladies and gentlemen, please do feel free to type into the chat and Robert will moderate for us and uh, 
and, and ask those questions. But I'm going to ask Carmen a softball question to start off with, right? Which is that I said that your bio was crazy, Carmen, crazy long, and you've got lots of stuff in your career. So maybe in just a couple of minutes, tell us a little bit about your career to date and how you ended up here doing what you're doing. Well, thanks. And thanks for having me here. It's really great to be here. Um, get, a, get out of the Sid Sydney office virtually, at least. Um, Mike and I are both involved in Ascolite. I actually presented on lecturing at the last Ascolite. It, um, what was it called? I think it was called, it wasn't called Don't Lecture Me. It was, it was called I Will Not Be Lectured. And so from that Pecha Kucha presentation, I think that sparked Mike's interest because I know Mike has a sort of a slightly different view to, to I. And then I thought, what better, what better forum to talk about it in than a community of practice, actually. So how did I get here today? Well, one of the things was via this Ascolite presentation. I think it was a really good experience and sparked lots of conversation and discussion about where lectures are heading. And the other thing is the community of practice uh, at Ascolite. I was, I actually joined up as a mentee a few years ago, which was also a really good experience at Ascolite. And I've also connected with the TEL advisors, the technology enhanced learning advisors through Ascolite. And I really learned a lot about um, delivering online and teaching online through that community of practice as well. Because I've actually come, as I said through the slides, I've come through lots of different sectors to university. And I've come from a really strong learning design background where I've really been focusing on teaching as a learning design, as, as a design science. So I really come at teaching, learning, lecturing from that perspective like teaching as a design science. And so, yes, that's a little bit about me, I guess. Awesome. Well, actually, that leads really well into the other question, the second question I wanted to ask you. And I'd written, give us an overview of your philosophy when it comes to transformation and teaching. But yeah. I actually think uh, you kind of did that, right? You said, I'm into learning design. So tell us a little bit about it. it teaching as a design science. Why, why is teaching a design science? Is, what you're saying is that if we prepare it properly, it's easier to teach it or am I simplifying too much there? Oh yeah, I, that's definitely one aspect of it. Of course, if you've got the time to set up your, your classes, they're obviously gonna be a lot better, aren't they? So that's kind of just a given, I think. But when I talk about teaching as a design science, uh, I'm really thinking about um, what's known as the conversational framework um, from Diana Lauriard. And I'll, I'll put the, the links and all of that in the chat pod later when we finish chatting. Um, and it's basically this idea that learning design and teaching can be looked at in different categories. And so one category might be acquisition, where you think um, in certain situations, students just need to acquire knowledge. They just need to learn, for example, the basic concepts. They have to acquire that before they can do anything with it. And then there are other categories of learning, which are more like collaboration and um, producing knowledge. So it, they depend, these categories depend on the different types of um, disciplines, if you will, some some are more heavy in the production side of side of things like engineering. You need to actually produce something or an artifact if you're an artist. So all different ways to learn that we all know about. Um, but what I tend to find in universities, having come through, especially primary, not primary high school and vocational is that in universities, for all sorts of good reasons, we do tend to focus a lot on the acquisition side of things and that usually manifests as a lecturing kind, a lecture. So, I mean, there are such things as active lectures. Of course there are. There are lots of fantastic lecturers who, who make their lectures entertaining who build in polls, who, you know, get students to think, pair, share, and, and all of those sorts of things. That, that is true. But I think fundamentally the lecture format is a transmission kind of model. It is a kind of a model where 
we're expecting students to acquire knowledge, to listen, to passively consume rather than actively learn. There you go. So I, 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 I had written next, tell us, talk to us about lectures and how you feel about that. We're leading into that. Well, <laughs> what the, it's like you anticipated my questions and I didn't send them Carmen in advance. Um, but um, that's really interesting, that idea that, that, that we lean into the acquisition, that you've got this model of, of several different things, acquisition, but as well as that, the, I've forgotten the others, but the idea of collaboration and working together and creating things. Um, uh, but you're saying as, as academics, we lean into the acquisition bit. Um, I think it's more, it's not, not more as academics as such. I think it's the university structures. Mm. I think, you know, we tend to organise time and resources around that model. Okay. Um, and we are called lecturers, you know. Yes. We're not called facilitators generally or teachers. Um, okay. So I think it's not just a personal preference that people go, oh, I think, you know, lectures are great. I think there, there's a whole kind of story around that. But um, we tend to have, when we tend to have a big percentage on acquisition. Mm, mm. So, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I'm not, <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't learning design sort of drive that as well? I mean, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm misunderstanding what learning designers are, but this very idea of sort of, of designing things and putting, putting videos and putting various other resources on a, on an LMS or something like that, doesn't, isn't that also driving acquisition or is your learning design a little bit different? Is your learning design more holistic and components of that include the collaboration and the co-design parts that you were talking about? Well, that's actually a really fantastic question, actually. Because I try. <laughs> yeah, no, that really is a thoughtful question because, it, you know, I guess it's the semantics and the wording of things. But mm -hmm. learning design, you know, you immediately think of designing a page, designing an artifact, designing a video, designing something that's quite static that, mm. that students consume. But I guess what I should be saying is that you want to be designing for learning. So mm. I guess in a way you can't design anybody's learning. You can't actually mandate what people are going to learn. So you're designing for learning. So designing for learning means, yes, you will definitely have some acquisition and, and presentation and demonstration and all those things there because they're necessary. But um, designing for learning can also include a lot, a lot wider range of collaborative kind of activities. Oh, there's a hand awesome. up. No, no, you, you did well. You corrected my understanding of learning design. That's exactly what I was wishing well, for you to do. It's a very, it's a very, it's like one of those terms like blended and online. Yes. When people talk about it, they often mean different things. And even when we talk about lectures, yes. how do we define lectures? I, I bet you if I ask that, and I even got this on a notepad, so I'm going to put it in the chat pod. I bet yeah. you even in this room, we all have different ideas about what a lecture is. Yes, I think so too. I think that's uh, so Robert does indeed have a question as our, as our moderator. He's going to just sneak in a question. Yeah, I'm obviously fielding questions from the field, which please put any in, but we haven't had any. <laughs> and um, I do find it interesting, right? Because we're all as academics, someone tied to the research, right? And we always forget that by definition, um, you know, you have to operationalize your term, right? And that was one of the biggest things in my dissertation, which was looking at working memory and writing. Up until my dissertation was published, the definition of writing was using the towel, the test of oral written language. And all they had to do was correct punctuation errors in written sentences, which to me, it was in no way writing, but the whole field had used that as their definition of writer prior to my dissertation, where I went in and developed measures because they were going, how do you count punctuation in someone's essay to measure punctuation? Like they couldn't fragment that stuff out. So we always forget that even in conversations, everything is operationalized. Right, so how do we operationalize lecture and all this stuff? So that was what my question was for you is, um, 
in this any world of academia where we are stuck with a limited amount of time and stuck with a max amount of students, how does in your world this process look like in which we do have to go following because I'm a very Vygotskyan, a part where we do have to lecture, model, then work into practicing uh, with their own. What does that actually look like in this, you know, world where the average university in Australia has somewhere around 30,000 students, you know, which means faculty are not getting classes of 20. So what does, you know, that look like in a room, in an environment, in this world? Yeah, g give us oh, all your University of Sydney <laughs> secrets, Carmen. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, look, I don't think any one person or university would claim to have cracked that one, a crack um, scale. I mean, that's the big challenge that universities face, isn't it? The, there's been this massification of university over the last few decades. And the numbers are incredible, and it's not a ratio that you would have in school. Absolutely not. So um, the project that I'm working on at the moment at the business school is looking just at that problem, actually. How do you enable more connected learning, more social learning, more you know, collaboration, more of the type of learning that actually will help students sort of deal with this crazy world that we've created, <laughs> you know? Um, how, how do you do that at scale? And there are no easy answers. There are lots and lots of different strategies. And I'm sure that a lot of you in this room are practicing some of those now. Um, so I guess there is, that is just going to be a constant challenge. And the biggest challenge for universities, I think, um, going forward because, you know, you look at all the, what's going on in the world today, all the sort of crazy, wicked problems, and students are going to need some amazing skills to try and tra tackle them. <laughs> and they're, you know, they're the leaders of the future. So they really need to be educated to kind of collaborate together on working that stuff out. Um, and the model that we have is very much from a different world, from a different century, when I, yes. I literally finished my university in a different century, mm. um, when I, I think I finished university before there was um, before there was internet, really, um, mm. dial up came later, you know, so I think we're still stuck to a certain extent with this lecture, lecture tutorial or lecture workshop type um scenario when um yeah we really need to be moving on from it interesting it's interesting because uh, um you're at a tr at your university of sydney right yeah which would be a sandstone in australia yeah. but if you look at like a, a sandstone like in america their enrollment rate is two thousand students a term so yeah. they've gone we don't want that mass, we just charge a lot. And we'll allow 1,200 per people per term. And that way we can do that interactive group session. You know, everybody at Harvard, part, their, their, their projects are super interactive, super involved, but you don't have more than 30 students in any one class because you don't enroll any more than 1,200 students a year. Yeah, I think that's maybe one solution, but. Um, but at the other end of the spectrum, I do think that it's a good thing that um, more people go to university. So I guess we've got to look at ways where we can, you know, as much as possible leverage technology to sort of help people connect at scale and look at different ways to do things. I, I'm not claiming to have the answers by any means, otherwise I'd be a rich, rich woman, as you speak. But um, I think it's, it's, we can't sort of, it doesn't seem that we can actually return to previous times. Uh, we can't sort of adopt the school model. So we've sort of got to work out um, how to do that in a better way. And as I said, immensely challenging. And as I can see in the, in the chat pod already, there are some 
there's some people are already kind of thinking, well, lectures can become more interactive and you can have the questions pre and post delivery. Um, you know, people are already grappling with that and working out ways. How can we design patterns designed for learning more, for, for more kind of interactive learning, active learning rather than passive learning? But I, I agree the... Um, the traditional lecture, the acquisition, and is, you know, can be flipped, etc. But even that, we're reaching the limits of our, our usefulness for some of that because there is so much good and accessible content on the web as well. So it's really there are a lot of wicked sort of thorny issues in there about changing all of that. If you change the lecture you change everything at university, I think. I think it's that important. Oh, that's that's a hot take. If you change the lecture, you change the university system. Do you think, do you think, uh, again, I mean, Robert highlighted that you're at a GO8. Um, yes. And, and some other GO8 people that we've spoken to recently, I think they've implied that mm academics are keen to get back into the classroom. I won't tell you which university it was, but, um, but you know, almost chomping at the bit to get back to face-to-face oh, yeah. -to, -face to that old-fashioned kind of... Uh, is, do you think that we have, as you said earlier, have we changed things? How, is it going to be different going forward? Or 12 months from now, we're going to look at things and go, oh, it's all gone back to the way it was pre-pandemic because the pandemic is over and all these academics are very resistant to change. And they've all mm. kind of gone back into the classroom. Again, these are these are really, really interesting questions that, you know, remain to be seen, I suppose. But I can say from my perspective, uh, at the Sandstone University, in some ways, because they had they have such a emphasis on face-to-face -face delivery, you know, it was all about the come to the Hogwarts castle and uh, you know, this these amazing old buildings and this tradition and this history and all of those sorts of things that are fantastic. Um, but, you know, that's that face to face experience is is what people sometimes are after. But I think students during the pandemic have said, you know what, um, even the ones that live in Sydney, I live in Penrith and travelling into Sydney for a lecture is actually not that really effective. Uh, I'm don't think I need to do that anymore <laughs> you know so I don't think it's I think it's really uneven I think where people have had a great face-to-face -face experience yes of course they're keen to do that again but um you know like I hesitate to say that it just I don't think it will go back to exactly as it was because students expectations have changed a bit uh, I think but that at the same time there's a nostalgia um, oh, well. Even if the university experience wasn't brilliant, there's a nostalgia for seeing other students. And for I think that what it gets, it gets down to is what students miss is the social aspect of it. They don't miss, you know, us, I hate to say that, <laughs> in yes. so much as they miss each other, maybe. Gabriella said that in the chat. She said, now that lectures can be recorded and saved, there would be no point for students to attend unless they can interact. It's that idea that, well, if we're recording them, well, then the kid that lives in Penrith can watch it in Penrith. He doesn't need to come into the city. Uh, but you're right. It's interesting that the converse is that they may miss the, they miss the social interaction that may or may not happen at the university pub, you know, in the sandstones. But I love the idea that they won't miss us, right? They're missing the, they're missing that stuff. Well, I guess they miss us to the corridor chats and, you know, being able to sort of just ask somebody something quickly and easily. I mean, all of that stuff can be done with technology, but it's just a bit clunkier and harder to do. So mm. either we've just got to get better at that and students included. And um, But I, I understand that there is a nostalgia among some academics too to return to face-to-face -to -face teaching because... Uh, just from a purely kind of COVID point of view, it was rough, wasn't it, the last couple of years? I mean, it's, I don't know how many lockdowns you had in Queensland, but we had some really long lockdowns here where, we, you know, if you live in a small unit or a smaller place, which you tend to in Sydney, you're like, I need to get back in the office. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, um, and I think the students, that was, that was a, a factor as well. In Sydney, I, not to the status in Melbourne, but yeah. I was going to say. 
<laughs> it got worse as you went south. Queenslanders, we were pretty lucky. I think we only had a couple. But, um, yeah, I I, uh, I agree with you. I think what I'm hearing from you is that the jury's still out. Uh, Robert's got, a, got another question. Robert, go for it. Yeah, uh, so it started, it was weird. I had the question a while back and then it transitions weirdly in my head. Um, bring us back. That's okay. You can bring us yeah, back. No, so I'm a developmental psychologist, right? And so, you know, I had, and, and what pre COVID, pre actually what I would call phone technology, right? When I was getting my PhD, um, we were taking, I had to, as a PhD in ed psych, my professor was a traditional psych, cog psych. So I was mandated, I had to take classes from the School of Psychology, not just in the School of Education. So one of the issues that was really big in the social research classes I had to take was this feeling that kids had pre-internet, right? Pre-phone was all, were already starting to lose their social skills of solving problems. Because what was happening is our world had transitioned to a place in which we never allowed kids to be alone anymore. What happened was kids went from one practice to another practice, to a teacher led thing, to a parent led thing. And the research was showing there wasn't this time where they were out playing sports with each other and had to decipher rules and problems and solve those problems without an adult present. And what the fear was, is these kids were never going to grow to learn to create rules and solve problems without a, a, a person present. So pre-COVID, that was my fear, right? Like, because I used to push my kid, like I wouldn't solve problems when I would have our neighbors play in the backyard. If they got into fights, I'd let them solve it, right? Opposed to me coming in and solving it as a parent, it being the, the, this point, I, you know. And as I hear this thing, like, Kid, students don't need to come in to the uni and they don't need to come in. I'm, I'm wondering how you see this. Where are they going to start having to solve problems on their own without an adult present if they're never there? Um, because yeah. at some point they're going to have to solve the problems of Russia or someone's got to be the adult <laughs> when powers start doing things. And how are we going to solve these adult problems if we keep looking for the adults and we're all gone? Well, absolutely. I think um, one, of, one of the interesting things about problem solving and all of that is that, and you think about physical space, do we have to be in the same room to, or in the same space to collaborate and communicate? Well, as much as I, you know, as much as the next person I'll complain about Zoom and the black boxes and, you know, how dry it was compared to a face-to-face -face experience. But at the same time, we still could do that. So, so I, on, the, on the flip side of that, imagine if we had the pandemic and no Zoom. Uh, what would we have done? I mean, I, I do come from a distance education background. And when I started in distance education, the, the students would ring up to enroll and you would send them out a brick to yeah. read by you know a package like that yeah, yeah. Um, we called it a brick when i was an undergrad so it's funny you say that but yeah yeah you'd have to go to the copy shop and pick up the brick yeah so you can imagine for all sorts of people that was just not a great way to learn uh, <laughs> so um the dropout rate was massive and you know people struggled with that learning and people struggled with more i think in, in the pandemic with the motivation, with the effective aspects, with the emotional aspects and with structuring their time. Um, that was really a big thing. So again, people miss the social aspect of lecturing, although, you know, not everybody, some students did. And what they also missed was, oh, I have to be there from 10 to 11. Um, whereas at home, oh, I might, you know, I might just um, have the camera off and make a cup of tea or have a lie down and, you know, yeah. So, I mean, I guess there's, there's lots involved and I, I did do a sort of some interesting research with a colleague of mine on learning spaces and how the boundaries of space have really blurred during COVID, students' learning spaces as well. But what it foregrounded to me was that 
you know, we were lucky to have Zoom. We were lucky to do those things. And we were lucky to keep that thread, even though it was a thread. <laughs> but it was tough. And I can't imagine what it was like in Melbourne. But even in Sydney, there were times where, you know, you would hear quite devastating, quite heart-wrenching stories. And, yeah, it was tough. I think I think we're leaning in towards maybe convincing you we should drag some of the students back for a lecture. We don't need to call it a lecture, Carmen. We can drag them back to the campus for other things if you'd like. But, uh, you know. For social uh, events. Yeah, social <laughs> events. David yeah. mentions in the comments that some of the sheen has gone from lectures as an, uh, as knowledge has become easier to access. And I think that's a great okay. comment, David. I, I uh, And he mentioned earlier that idea that lectures are not the primary, primary mean of delivery anymore because of technology enhanced learning. But Alan sort of as a counterpoint to that a little bit earlier in the chat mentions that uh, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to generate this online content. So Alan, I guess, is kind of going, well, it's easier for me to run a lecture than it is for me to generate this content. Is this where we where we slot in the learning designer, Carmen? This is probably the last thing I'm going to ask you. Is this okay. the is this the pitch for the learning designer to step in and help people like Alan with that kind of thing? Is oh, that yeah, absolutely. I mean, it takes a village. It really does. It takes a village because transposing lectures to online recordings is not active learning. You know that's not that's not a great online experience, and I think we all know that. Yeah, and and that's what students have, um, you know, sometimes complained about. If, they, if there was like a two-hour lecture online or something, yeah, it's not very engaging. Of course, um, mm -hmm. high quality though interactive online learning delivery is expensive. It, it, the design time is huge. Um, it's ten times as long, I would say. Um, and the professional development around online facilitation is also a, a huge thing too. And the, the time and the um, permission to experiment and just to try things out is huge. And I think a greater investment in educational technologists and technology can help, but it's not the answer. It's not, the, uh, it's not just going to be a magic bullet to hire an educational technologist and that will make it all better. It is, it is really a fundamental shift in how you thinking about teaching and learning and then thinking, oh, well, what are the, what's the stuff I need to make that happen? And part of that stuff is definitely going to be digital learning designers and so on that can help with that. People with uh, specialities and expertise, I know that, um, you know, we still have this model of academics having to do everything if they've even if they've got a unit with a thousand students in it meanwhile you know like no no other business would run like that I think um mm -hmm. that you just you know chief cook bottle washer dishwasher and everything you know so <laughs> I love it. I love that message. Yeah, we as academics don't have to do everything, but what we need to do first is realise what we want to achieve in the classroom as an academic and then find people like yourself or learning designers at CQU to help actually mm -hmm. uh, actually develop some of this content. I, I think that's an awesome message. That's a great takeaway. Do you have time for the Telcop 10? Right, the Telcop 10 is 10 questions, kind of like the Stephen Colbert questionnaire, um, where we just ask you some things. Have you got time for that? Yep. yep. Awesome. Love it. Okay. Are you ready? So the first one is, what is your favorite technology word? My favorite technology word. Yes. <laughs> um, interactive. Interactive, I'm not surprised. There we go. What is your least favourite technology word? I almost think I'm... Like Recording. One. Recording. <laughs> I, love, I thought you were going to say lecture. <laughs> what technology gets you excited? Ooh, uh, at the moment, data visualisations. Oh, okay. Do you want to build on that just a little bit? Um, it's very hard to do. Uh, I haven't kind of figured it out. There's a few different tools, but I really like this idea that um, you can present stories okay. around data in a visual way because it's really hard to unpack a lot of data stories. Uh, stories. It's really hard to understand complex data. So if you can visualise it in an interactive way, it's amazing. I, I think there's... Uh, it's a specialist skill, but um, I think data literacy is 
very that, important. I love data storytelling, storytelling with data. Data storytelling, like the Guardian, um, data journalists and data journalism, all of that okay. thing is so interesting. If, you, if you're interested in that, I can recommend Pudding.cool. They have okay. these amazing Pudding. interactive cool. stories. Okay, what technology turns you off or what turns technology do you not like? Oof. Uh, what turns me off? Uh, a lot of old university legacy systems. Okay. They'll remain nameless. Old uni <laughs> legacy systems. I think you've got a bunch of heads nodding along on that one. What technology sound or noise do you love? Uh, technology sound or noise. Bing! <laughs> I do like that. Oh, oh! I, I think a lot of people say they hate that email oh, ding. Yeah. Oh, not the email ding. I like it when, you know, like if you get this sort of instant feedback. Okay. You, if you answer a question or something and it goes, oh, yes. oh, you know, I, I'm a go. sucker for that. I always a, posit a positive ding. I like that. So then what technology, sound or noise do you hate? Um, I think it's the silence of the Zoom. I was going to say, it's like the silence of the lambs. The <laughs> silence of the Zoom. When you're trying to get some conversation going and you, you're thinking, oh, oh, I, I love it. 10 seconds now, but it's just dead. And I you think just that's there. one of the best answers we've had. The awkward silence of the Zoom room. I love it. Uh, it what is, because is... like, it's almost like the silence of the Zoom equates to the black screens of the Zoom. Yeah, that's right. It's, yeah. That's a great, really... great answer. Yeah. I hate it. Uh, what's your favorite technology slang word do you, or acronym? We love acronyms in technology. Ah, ooh, an acronym. Or, uh, or slang word, whichever you prefer. Yeah, yeah. I like to say data instead of data. Oh, that sounds better. Oh. <laughs> uh, data versus data. Oh, that's a big one. Um, okay, last couple of questions. What profession other than what you're currently doing would you like to attend? Oh, yeah. I always fancied I'd like to be a website designer. But okay. um, I think in the end, I, I you know, I wasn't technique techie enough for it. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I was never artistic enough. I had all the technical skills, but couldn't design my way <laughs> the paper bag. Uh, what profession would you really not like to do? You know what? I don't think I would like to be anything to do with real estate or politics politician okay. yeah yes yeah, same here i'm way too frank and honest right, it'd just be too crazy roller coaster I'd, <laughs> yeah oh, be too much stress <laughs> and in last one if technology heaven existed what would you like god to what would you like to hear god say to you when you arrived at the pearly gates well, if technology hard. didn't exist if technology heaven existed oh, technology heaven what would you love to hear the technology god say to you when you arrived at the pearly gates i think it just it will do what you tell it to <laughs> <laughs> come inside it all just works i yeah. love it i love it i yeah. love it yeah awesome well that's it that's the telcop 10 thank you so much of carmen as stephen colbert would say you are now known Thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for coming along. I know you have another appointment to get to. Yeah. Um, but if anyone wants to follow you, you are CJ Vallis on yes. Twitter and various other socials, right? I'm going to type it in the chat, make sure I spell it right. Is that correct? Yeah, that's great. And I, I prepared some links and stuff. Oh. Uh, so you can have a look at that if you're interested. And I just thought I'd better not claim credit for the title okay it wasn't me that don't lecture me was actually um carl v Mann. okay oh, anyway you're, re you're <laughs> remixing it you're remixing, I'm remixing. It. that's it okay well thank you so much for your time thank we'll let you so get your away to your appointment but ladies and gentlemen of the telcop don't leave daryl is going to talk to us for a few minutes but thank you so much carmen for thank your you time. it was fun bye bye okay daryl claire uh, is going to tell us a little bit just to finish us off about some great practice, good practice. Daryl's always good practice, but he's going to talk to us a little bit about good practice in technology enhanced learning. Um, I'm going to hand the stage over to Daryl. I'm sure if you have any questions, you can throw them in the chat. Daryl's an awesome multitasker, so he'll uh, he'll see them and spot them and feel them Audio's away. working okay for me? Yes, you sound good. Okay. Yeah, I, my new Microsoft modern speaker for travel. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually in Rockhampton campus at the moment. 
running a paramedic res school. So I've got a bit of a weird and wonderful background um, of everything. I'm just going to that screen shared, okay? Everybody? Yeah, sorry, yeah, I sorry. put my thumb up, but you didn't see it. But yes, that's oh, yeah, screen shared. I've, I'm on a fairly small laptop screen today. So I just want to go really briefly for a few things, just quickly. Um, and if any are interesting, then it's something we could probably do a further, uh, a longer session on. Um, the printing, I won't talk too much about Scott Morrison. I was working away and he just popped his head in there. So um, one of the things that I'm using this week for printing, this is a, a 3D printed laryngoscope. And I just bought a drain cam and shoved it in it. So it's a really great way to teach airway management for much we, cheaper than the $5,000 one you can buy. This I don't know if your me. screen is moving, Daryl, for me. It's anyway. not moving? I can just see topic one tasks. Okay, your screen is paused. Resume share. Okay. Ah, so I'm going to have to probably share each screen as I go. That's okay. Now I understand that. Okay. Well, that's annoying. Not having the two screens, but we'll um, we'll do a bit by bit, hey? And just bear with me a little bit. Always when you're not in your own space, it gets a bit interesting to figure out how to do it all, doesn't it? Okay, so we'll share another screen. Yeah, this is uh, this is one I've done this week. That shared okay this time? That we can see that one now. Awesome. Yeah, so it's just a cheap drain can um, and printed that myself, but it gives students a really good understanding of airway management. Um, so I've got to stop sharing and share each one as I go, I guess. But another one that I've been using this week, which has been quite interesting, is, is 360 video in a bit of a different way as a debriefing tool. So I'm just going to share the sound if I can with this. You'll see what I mean. So this case here, see, okay. And you've got to get used to the fact I'm using an Apple Mac after 30 years and I'm still We can't hear you at the same time as the video, I don't think, Daryl. You might need to show us the video and then talk, tell us what you're showing us. We still can't hear you. Yeah, we're still having trouble hearing you. I'm not sure what happened there. Mac, oh, is that, that, is that better? We can hear you now. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. We won't do anything else about sound, all right? Um, the last couple of things I'm just going to show is some uses of H5P and things like that. But when well, I tell us, tell us about that video before you, because we couldn't hear you talking over the top of it. So what was the, the idea of the video, the video was simply to um, basically a way to debrief students where they could actually put the view where they wanted to, that they could turn the camera to look at the part they're interested in. And the beauty of it is we publish that to a secure site and they've got that as an ongoing learning aid for those sessions that they can go back to. I tell my students on this course, we're not actually here to assess them, we're to make a good video by the end of the week. And by the end of the week, they've made a great video and they've been assessed at the same time. But it gives us a chance to debrief every part of the video by moving the video to exactly what we wanna see. And we found by putting the camera, and I just use this very short tripod here, we're about to do one straight after lunch. Um, in the middle of the mannequin's legs, we have everything and we can capture the whole scene and it becomes a great training aid. So that's one thing I've been doing. The other thing I've been looking at is gamification. Now I'm going to show you two examples of that. 
Let's go firstly to... Now, hopefully this should be fine because it's all the one screen this time. Um, that go to Birthwell Village? Yeah, yeah Every... all good. All good. Okay. This is one that I'd love midwifery to come and talk to you about. We're in the final process of this. They have basically in their grad cert um, this where they do case studies and work through them. So what we've done is we've made a bit of a game map where you actually go through and you've got all the case study information here. You can actually go there, work through it, and any time you go back to Birthwell Village, you may have to go over to the hospital and go through some, you know, different videos you need to look at. You might want to go across to the um, uh, supermarket and get the dietary guidelines. So we're gamifying that. And one I've just started working on is something I've done in another role, in my scout role, I just want to show you, because I think it's got some really great potential. This is a virtual escape room. And I've actually figured out a way we can actually do this. Um, now, I'm going to stop and make sure I've shared sound with this again. So, yep, sound shared. Um, the idea behind this is to do some sort of learning activity in a game. So as we go into this, we've got a story. Are you still hearing me talk at the moment? Yeah, you yeah. can hear cool. both it and you. Well done. Yeah. So the idea is they're inside a room. Each of these pictures is an activity. So these are for a scout activity, but just imagine we can do these for anything. I picked one that I know I'm going to answer okay. Check my answer. So I've earned a J1. So the idea is participants need to go through. When they've got all that, they can come over here. And we know now the J is worth a one to get out. What I've been working on, this is developed in a fairly complex package, but I think I've worked away. All of these variables, like the timer up here, the timer on each of these event things, I can make those timers variables that you set in the admin screen. What I've now come across is the ability to make these pop-ups a variable that goes to a H5P. So I can make the whole room up and then you can make your own things by just pointing the variable to actually what we're doing. You can see how it just becomes a bit more engaging for the students. Um, and they get three minutes on this, but you can set them anything. And if they don't answer it in the time, it just disappears the screen and they've got to try again in two minutes. So they've got a 40 minute timer on the top and the events are all timed so that um, if you don't get through, you get, you failed. So that is, is just a different concept, but I think escape rooms are, are fun things and it's a fun way. I've done some of these with maths, and I'm doing an ECG one at the moment called Slave to the Rhythm, where these are all pop-ups about ECGs. I could make this multi-room, so you click here and go to another room with a 360 object like that. So that and things like that, I think, offer some interesting things. The last thing I'll just spend two or three minutes on is, is H5P itself. We all know H5P is there, but trying to make it a bit more usable is a bit of an interesting challenge. I wanted to make it look a bit more like e-learning. So I've actually made a new template, which I want to share with everyone. Um, I wanted to make it look like a learning object. I wanted it all to be on one screen, mobile friendly, and have a menu. 
so that a person could go, I want to go to that specific section. And believe it or not, this is just the course presentation in H5P, especially adapted to do this. And it's really simple to build with. There's free screens that are in there. You just keep duplicating this screen. It duplicates the menu buttons and navigation buttons. And the last thing you do is you come back and you put your menus in. Um, I'm starting to use it on all the things now that I'm back in the school that I'm building. And the feedback we're getting is, is really good. One, because it stays on one screen. It's mobile friendly. It's responsive. It, it, it um, works with all of the um, screen readers and all of that sort of stuff. So it's a simple concept. And like I said, to actually do them, um, they're really quite simple. So if we go into the settings of this one, you'll see that it is basically a H5P course presentation. What I have done to make it something that is a bit more usable for students I've turned the navigation off and activated surface mode. So it can be used with swipes, like you're on an iPad or something like that. Um, and then when we actually put the slides in, this slide, we just clone it each time. The menu buttons, the navigation buttons going next and back are always in. The menu button always goes to the menu. And the last thing that you need to do to update this is the original master's got a huge menu either side. You just put what you want in it. So <clears throat> that could be something, Michael, worth down the track spending some more time on. These are uh, just making them H5P a little bit more user-friendly. One very last one that I'm using this week and something that really interests me is what we call progressive web apps. Progressive web apps are independent of the app store. So I make an app. And it's just shared by the link. For anyone who is interested, I'll put this in the link. This is on my own website just because I don't have anywhere to put it right at the moment. Um, but have a play with it and, and see what you think. Um, this has worked incredibly well for my students. Every ambulance service uses an app of some kind. Um, so we create this app and the things that I want them to do in the app, like the questions I want them to ask in our scenarios are here. And really, this one screen, when I get to it, these will work by swipes on a phone, or you can, uh, yeah, this one here covers most of what they've got to do in their assessments. But this goes a lot further. This covers all their skills. I think there's about 300 screens in this app. It just, it's just a teaching tool. But what we're finding, well, I'm finding, especially for students, they're used to phones. So for them, this is a great learning tool. I had students from my last week course um, contact me over the weekend how good it is for them that they can look at this whenever they want. We put some fairly complex things in here like their ECG references and things like that I've built for them. They can start to understand how the heart works. But if we go back to the home on this one, they can also, you know, go look at a very particular rhythm and actually view the ECG. And that's all just off of one web URL. And anyone who is trying it, if you actually um, go save to your home screen, that will turn it into a, an app. It'll actually just then start to open as an app. Progressive web apps will also get to a stage where they'll install everything and don't need the internet. I haven't got to that chapter in the book, but I'm working on it. So that's just a really quick overview of some of the things that interest me at the moment. And Michael, I would think to get the the ladies to talk about Birthwell Village, how they're going to use that. They're conducting their whole term based around the app. Every story is in the app, every resource is in, in the actual, the Birthwell Village. And the escape rooms, I think, has got some real um, uh, opportunities. Like I said, I believe I can build a SCORM template that anyone then can change the variables and change the things just using standard H5P. They're going to be embedded in, a, in the web window inside my SCORM. So you could change it week for week, just create a whole library of SCORM, uh, of H5P simple activities, whether they're matching, drag and drop, um, and you've got an escape room that adds a bit of fun because it's timed 
At the end of it, it prints a certificate to the student and says how quick they did it as well, um, so that they can actually, I beat your score. It's just adding a little bit of fun competition in there. So that- I would definitely say, Daryl, like um, you got so many positive comments that, that um, it would definitely behoove us to actually have a longer meeting. Cause like one of the things with Daryl who I love is that uh, it, watching Daryl is the most scary thing on the planet. Cause uh, you, you just think, I can't do what Daryl's doing unless we slow Daryl down <laughs> <laughs> because you're so fast and so good. Um, you know, it, it, it can be daunting. So it would be great to like, say, have a, uh, this is a great intro, you know, to do a later um, meeting where you kind of either you show us the H5P part or show us the, the how to do, because you went so it's awesome. And I think everybody is really interested in it. And, um, but in this amount of time, we all feel like, oh gosh, we can't do that. Yeah, I just wanted to show you some of the options. I saw one question, what am I doing for the progressive web app? I can build it in anything I want. I'm building that in my, my one, my favorite package, Lectora, but it could be anything. The key to a progressive web app is a tiny bit of code making sure it's on a secure server um, and it will just work basically. It's really simple and there's actually an online builder which will build the code you need for you now. I think the H5P would be a really great one for people to start with, especially those, I've made a whole heap of other templates too. I mean, in my perfect world, I, wouldn't, I would use other products than H5P, but I understand it's too, an expense, too expense. So my thing is to create H5P that is as good as these products. And um, certainly the feedback we've got from the two units we've put them in has been quite really, really positive. One, the student's not scrolling everywhere and everything's on one screen and there is an ability to go back and find the bit you want. So I think that would be a really great one to do, even a bit of a workshop on Michael. Awesome. Love awesome. It. No, I totally agree. Look, I, I knew that what would happen with you, Daryl, is you would give us a whole bunch of different stuff. And this gives people a great opportunity to say, I love this bit. I love that bit. Come back to us and say, and, and Rosalind, for example, has already said in the chat, hey, a bit more on H5P would be awesome. And so I agree with Robert. If we, I, I see a question about sharing the app. Share it far and wide. If you find anything wrong with it, let me know. I'll fix it. Um, I, I, it's probably a little paramedic skewed at the moment, but I want to make it health generic, the app, so that any health student can use it. I give it away to anyone. I'm really happy to do that. It's, it started off as a, a book that I wrote for myself when I was learning paramedics, so I knew what I was doing. And then I just turned it into an app as I went. There you go. And Natalie said we need an how to build an app PD. Yes, that would be awesome. So let me, uh, I think that we've, we've achieved what we wanted, which is giving people a, a great idea of some great best practice that they can sort of think about. Let yep. me have a chat to Robert about how we might now action that into some sort of, uh, as you say, the Birthwell Village guys would be great to get back. But it sounds to me, Daryl, like people would also love to see you come back and talk through one of these ideas uh, in, in a bit more detail, H5P or, or app building as Natalie suggested. And I'm sure we can we can facilitate that. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, last year we ran a boot camp at one point, which was a whole day session for the Telcop. So let us know if that's something that you'd be Last year or the year before last? Year Probably before the year last. before last. The before, year before last with Daryl and Robert. It was, it was it was in the BC era before COVID. Before COVID, there you go. Mm. <laughs> so uh, so yeah, there we go. So we can definitely uh, facilitate something like that. Um, yeah. You know, there's two votes now for how to build an app PD. So thank you so much for that, Daryl. Um, but Thank that you was all. great and I appreciate you filling in at the end of Carmen. I knew it was just a teaser and a taster at the end of Carmen, but I thought that was a good, uh, that was mm, a good way no. to start. Um, Robert, any final comments before we let everyone go? I know that we're a few minutes over, so no. He's shaking his head. Okay, cool. Okay, not a problem. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time, both uh, with Carmen and also 
with our friend Daryl as well. I really appreciate everybody's time. As you go along, if you do have any questions, don't forget there is a Telcop mailing list. If you email the mailing list, then that will email all of the members of the Telcop. I'm sure that Mr. Daryl Clare would also field any questions from people. He's back in the school, as he said just before. He was in ITD for a couple of years, but now he's back in the school. But being back in the school, he's got scholarship as part of his job. And so I'm sure if he talked to people about uh, building something for nursing or various other disciplines, he'd be happy to talk about it. Absolutely. That. Absolutely. Yeah. I am I'm I'm getting some from nursing to help me tomorrow. I've got to teach emergency childbirth, and I'm not really happy with that one. So I've asked a midwife over. Comes the other is, way. This is the funny thing. Would you believe I've got a lady on this course who's eight months pregnant, so I've told her I really don't want the practical session. At <laughs> awesome. Oh, there we go. Okay, yeah. well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I know that we are keeping you by for 10 minutes, so thank you so yeah. much, everybody, for hanging around for a couple of extra minutes. As I said, if you've got any questions, shoot us an email. Otherwise, you'll see an announcement shortly for our next Telcop session, which should be in about six weeks or so, and we'll keep you in the loop about some sessions with Daryl or maybe even a boot camp. We'll see how things go. But thank you so much, everybody, for your time. Have a thank good you. Day.